me, tell me at what point did you things start to kind of shift between the two of you? So, you know, you went from being like a big brother to her to what, trying to get her into rooms alone. What kind of, what happened? How did you transition into this intimate, this, this inappropriate stuff? It may, it, it ended up getting more into that, shifting that way when my drinking and taking pills got a lot heavier and just wanting to be away from this situation and it just wasn't a good mix on my mind. We are about to watch the parole hearing for a cockroach who is doing it to his girlfriend's nine-year-old sister. What's the big deal anyways? Up for parole after serving nine years of his 10-year sentence. We'll unpack it with the details at the end. Good afternoon, Mr. Wyman. Hello. My name is Parole Officer Logan. Today is Friday, April 5th, 2024. And this is the hearing of the Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles. Following board members are present this afternoon and by stating their names on the record, certify they have reviewed all statutorily required documents and available pertinent information in preparation of this hearing. Good afternoon, Mike Paul. Good afternoon, Joy Chance. Panel member Page, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please state your name and inmate number for the record. Matthew Wyman, 411794. This hearing is being conducted in consideration of the parole application for Matthew Wyman 411794. He is serving a sentence of 20 years, executed, suspended after serving 10 years, followed by 10 years probation for sexual assault first, victim less than 13 after more than two years older. He is to appear on the sex offender registry for a lifetime. As of today, records reflect the parole eligibility date of April 23rd. 2024, but there is no victim input in this case. There is an offender accountability plan for the offender. It has been reviewed and shows he has completed tier two, voices, garner-based programs, dual recovery, start now, the short track sex offender program. He is enrolled in college courses and the CDL program, and he works as a janitor in recreation. Utilizing the statewide collaborative offender risk evaluation system, the offender's overall score falls within the low range of risk for recidivism. Utilizing the static 99R, the offender's overall score for sexual offense recidivism falls within the low to moderate range. Mr. Wyman, this is your opportunity to express to the board why you believe you should be granted parole. You may begin. Okay. Um, I would like to start by saying thank you for the opportunity for parole. While incarcerated, I did a lot of work on my life, rethinking my lifestyle and outlook on the world around me. One program that impacted me the most was Voices. I want to say, though, that Voices did not go too much into my type of offense, but it did dig deep into the victims and what the what the impact that it has on victims. Um, it opened my eyes to the damage that I caused my victim. And not only was she the victim, but her family, her brother, her sisters, her parents, and my own community, they all fell victim to my offense. Her family, because they had to help her through something traumatic, something that never should have happened to begin with. My family also felt big victim because I took myself away from them and, and put my life on a shelf. There were three deaths in my family since being incarcerated. Two aunts and my grandfather, in which because of my selfishness, I was not present to share the grief for my family or support them during those hard times. I have completed my drug and alcohol program and learned that drugs are not an excuse for my actions, although they do play a part, but they're not to blame. Upon my release, I will be joining an NAAA support group to further my rehabilitation. 
Drugs and alcohol do nothing but cloud your judgment and twist your personality for the worst. It may make you a monster with no sense of consequence. The book club group that they have here at Brooklyn CI, I was a part of the pilot in forming that group. We read the book, Laws of Human Nature. And that book really digs into helping you figure out who you are and where you stand in life. I have also completed my GED since incarceration, and I have graduated since then. And currently, I am enrolled in the Pell program, and I'm going to continue doing so upon my release. I'm on my second semester with straight A's. The vocational village within the DOC has invited me to participate in the CDL program, which is a career that I wish to pursue with permission from my parole officer. My scores on the general safety, air brakes, and practice tests were excellent passing scores. On the simulator, I always received between 95 and 100% on the simulated road courses. If you grant me parole here today, I plan on going home and helping my sister take care of my mother and continuing with my CDL so I can start a career. My mother has a large amount of medical conditions and would like to help her the best that I possibly can. My father, being a semi-truck driver for three to four decades, now has a lot of medical issues as well. And it would be great to spend quality time with my father and visit the places that we went to while I was growing up. I also looked into jobs. They have a job app on the tablet, and I have done a lot of research into that. And there's a lot of jobs out there that I can get before I get my CDO and then after I get my CDO. There's a lot of local jobs, there's a lot of regional jobs, there's a lot of over the road jobs. I plan on applying for either UPS warehouse or electric boat upon my release as well for an immediate permanent, for an immediate job. And finally, I, I, I really, I really want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I did. I want them to know that. Is that it, Mr. Wyman? That's it. Thank you for uh, thank you for that opening statement. Um, what we're going to do today. Um, is we're uh, we're gonna we've read the background of your case and we've read about your incarceration. Based upon that, we have some questions to arrive if you're suitable for parole. Um, and then we're going to talk about your case uh, as a board, and we're going to uh, give you a decision. Okay. Okay. And the questions today will start with board member Page. Thank you, sir chair. So Mr. Wyman, you did a great job with your opening statement. You covered a lot of ground. Um, I'm glad to see you and hear uh, you express remorse for your actions. Um, you, also, you also talked about the impact that your actions have had on not just the victim, but her family, her siblings, you know, and your community as a whole. Um, and I, and I want to get a little bit more into that. And I, I heard you talk about your substance abuse problem and um, how it affects the way that you uh, think. It distorts your thinking. Um, I, I want to start with the victim piece because that seems to be you're, you're really emotional about that. Can you um, share with us why, why the emotions? It's because she was like a sister to me. And one of the biggest things to me is trust. And that's what I broke. I broke somebody's trust, not just any person, but a small girl. Somebody that literally looked at me like I was a brother. And because it, it hurts. Yeah, it, 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 I understand. 
Um, and uh, I, I can appreciate your, I appreciate your sharing that with us. If you had an opportunity to speak to her and, and have her, and she say, well, why did you do this? Why did you choose me? Uh, what did I do to deserve this kind of thing? What would you say to her? That it's not her fault. She did nothing wrong. No, me as the adult should have known better before doing that. And I didn't. I took advantage of a situation that never should have even have happened in the first place. You know, tell and me I about just, the... Go ahead. I just, just want to tell her I'm sorry. I'm deeply sorry for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. Um, tell me, tell me at what point did you things start to kind of shift between the two of you. So, you know, you went from being like a big brother to her to what, trying to get her into rooms alone. What kind of, what happened? How did you transition into this intimate, this this inappropriate stuff? It may, it, it ended up getting more into that, shifting that way when my drinking and taking pills got a lot heavier and just wanting to be away from this situation and it just wasn't a good mix on my mind. It, so were it you, got were to, you, did you talk about in the in a, a sex offender treatment about the grooming process? Yes, we have we have went over that, yes. What did you learn? Um like about grooming? So grooming would be essentially, I guess it would be that. Yeah. It would be to that extent, that would be a portion of grooming. So you admit to trying to get her into rooms alone so that you could have her play out, you know, some of these sexual things, some of the, that you were taking out basically in frustration. And she just happened yes. to be the closest thing to you. So. Yes. So you know that going forward, you can't put yourself in a situation where you're in a room with a child, you know. Um, and I do understand that you um, um, were in a relationship with her mom. Is that right? Her sister. Sister. Yes, that's right. I wrote down the wrong thing. I, meant, I said it's wrong thing, I wrote down sister. Um, and um, going forward, how do you intend? I heard you talk about the the, the uh, treatment piece, the not the uh, substance abuse piece. You said you were going to go into NA and AA, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes, ma'am. And um, how do you intend to avoid situations like this? I mean, I understand that you were really at a low point in your life. You really felt like you had no independence. You had to rely on other people because you needed your job, you needed a place to stay and all of those things. How do you avoid getting back in that position or that low point in your life to where uh, you committed this offense? How do you avoid that? I am going to stick with my support system, which as of right now is my mother, my sisters, my father, my aunt and my cousins. Yes. And whatever sponsor that I have out there to help me through my NAAA, Anytime anything ever happens, to, those are people that I can call and vent to and try and just be around because they are all <laughs> positive influences. Does your family know what you've done? All of your siblings, your mom? Okay. Yes, and, and and that's important. I, I was just about to speak about the um the being open and honest piece. When you're when you don't have anything to hide from people, you, you tend to be honest. You know, yes. even even when you think that it's inappropriate to share, if you feel yourself going down that path, you first have to be honest with yourself before you can be honest with other people. But if you can say, I step step up and say that I did this, it should be virtually easy to, to say, you know, I'm struggling and ask for help kind of thing, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have always been open about what I did. I, I 
even while in here incarcerated when it comes to correctional officers and other inmates. Okay. I would rather give somebody the knowledge of who I am, what I've done, mm -hmm. and give them the option to talk to me or not to talk to me. Well, I, I mean, I can appreciate that today, but back when you committed this offense, that wasn't what, ha what was happening. You weren't saying to your girlfriend, listen, I'm frustrated and angry because I have to stay here and I want to leave kind of thing, or, or I'm doing this to your sister either. You know, you weren't, you were hiding those things. So I'm saying mm -hmm. that you have to be able to express yourself in a healthy way so that you create no more victims. Okay. Yes, um, I, I really do think that you've done a good job during this incarceration. I'm happy to see that you haven't received any disciplinary infractions. You don't have a lengthy criminal history. Um, you know, being on that sex offender registry for life is going to cause um, you know, a, li a lifestyle change for certain, you know, people aren't always going to want to be around a sex offender. They're going to have things to say, snide remarks, and I hope that your skin is thick enough to deal with that kind of thing because you will, you will be faced with that going forward, you know, um, and I would encourage you again to talk about that stuff when you're out in the community. You'll be in, um, what is it, the uh, CTBS is like the Connecticut uh, treatment center for sex offenders. And so yes. you'll be able to be open and honest with them and share, you know, because it's going to be difficult, but you can do it if you put your mind to it. You're young enough to do this. All right, I'm all set. Thank you for answering my question, sir. And I wish you thank you. Set. I'm all set. I agree with everything that they have said. I'm so glad to be right. I do too. <laughs> I have one question though. Are they, I, I see what you want to do for a master's. Are they going to let you out in the yard to see uh, see the eclipse next week? Um, no, last time we had an eclipse, uh, they wouldn't even allow us outside. Really? Something to wow. do with not being able to look. There's fear we're going to own our retinas. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I just thought uh, because you want to get a master's in astronomy. I just, uh, that's really... Uh, Really an interesting thing. I appreciate your input, um, your statement, the uh, answers to the questions offered uh, by board member Page. And uh, I really, I, I hear you. So uh, to get out there and do the right thing. Yes, sir. Board, yep. board member Page. Uh, sir, Chair, so Mr. Wyman has a limited criminal history. He's still extremely young. Um, this is a horrible case. Um, it sounds as if he's very remorseful. He's always taken responsibility for the role that he's played in this, although the specifics of the case, I know that he denies a little bit of it, but they'll get more into that when he's out in the community sex offender treatment. Um, he acknowledges that he has a substance problem. That's an issue for him. He intends to address that. He has lots of work um, uh, roles set ahead for himself. He's mm -hmm. taking the appropriate programs to address his criminal genetic needs. And I uh, believe that he would uh, be would benefit from some parole supervision prior to starting his 10 years of probation. So I would support his request for discretionary parole um, at his eligibility date and um, set conditions the same. Uh, I have no alcohol problem, sexual behavior, no contact with minors, no contact with victim AG. And he asked for half a house. I thought there was three victims. I don't have three victims. I have one with a with the JG as the mom. And the mom is a registered victim. So AG and JG? What do you see three, Ms. Joy, Ms. Chance? Uh, AG. Mm -hmm. AG. Mm -hmm. And another AG. I think one is male and one is female. Maybe it's children. And I will tell you where I got it from.
traffic right off here. My computer timed out. Yes, I can't breathe. So, so I would just do a, a AG and um, uh, you know, and the it, no contact with the victim and or the victim's family. So I, that's what I would do because they're both there as protected parties. I think it's just her parents. So her parents. So would we parents. That, that give it a AG and a JG? You can. I just did. Yeah, they are registered. So that we can. Yeah. Yep. It's a protective order too. Yeah. A lifetime protective order. Do you want that? No, no, no. She, uh, yeah. okay. That's I had the, the yeah. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. All right. And all right. So that'll do it. So um regarding Matthew Wyman four one one seven nine four. I moved to grant parole on or after April twenty-third, twenty twenty-four. Uh, with the following conditions, no alcohol consumption, halfway house placement, uh, community based treatment for problem sexual behavior, no contact with minors without parole officer's permission, no contact with victim or victim's family, AG, JG, and AG. Aye, right, sir, a second. Second. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and Mr. Wyman, you've been voted to parole. And we really, uh, you know, we, we want you to get out there and do the right thing. And I think you got it in your heart to do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good luck, sir. You're all set. You. You'll get all the paperwork next week. Thank you. The parole board is clueless, and it should raise huge red flags and be a huge concern. In my opinion, it is scary what we are watching. This is the same parole board that we just saw the other day who said basically the same things and let go a monster who was doing it to his two daughters from the age of two for eight years before he was caught. And here's another situation of a cockroach, a pedo, who's doing it to a nine-year-old girl, his girlfriend's sister. And what do they assume? What's the biggest problem with all of this? It's that the parole board, it never crosses their mind. It doesn't enter their thesis of their, of, of think it doesn't, there's nothing there that maybe this guy likes children. That maybe he's attracted to children. That maybe he is in a through and through pedo. Why does that not cross their minds? Why is that not a possibility? Instead, it's so. Why did he do this? Oh, I was stressed out. I was really insecure. I was counting on everyone. Oh, I see. So, so you just you just lashed out to the closest thing to you. I understand. So what are you going to learn when, when you're moving forward? You're going to learn to express yourself in a healthy way, right? You're going to be able to tell people that you're going through some stress. And then this way, you won't sexually assault a nine-year-old. This is so great. And it's like, are you mad? How dumb can you be you're the parole board do you not know anything about this class of offenders we're seeing it over and over and over again with this parole board and it's insanity it's scary it's recklessness this is unadulterated recklessness by the governor to handpick these people to keep the state of Connecticut and its children safe. It is scientific that people who had these disorders, it's scientific, there is no cure. But they just completely ignore that as even being a talking point. No, instead, she just happened to be the closest thing to you. You need to learn how to express yourself.
they even bring up briefly how he 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 didn't take how he denies culpability, but but he'll 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 figure that out on the outside. He'll figure that out in his sex programs on the outside. It's like he just spent nine years in prison, and you know what information they have that they're not sharing with us because they were going to parole him no matter what, because the DA gave twenty years, but really it's not because it's suspended out, so it's just a ten year sentence. Meriden Man was ordered to serve a decade in prison on Thursday for sexual assault of a nine-year-old girl in the case originated in Manchester. Matthew, who was 23, initially charged with 13 counts of first-degree sexual assault. 13 counts! He had been in custody since October uh, 23rd, 2015. He agreed to plead guilty to three charges and serve half a sentence with conditions according to the... Uh, blah, blah. Half the sentence. Half the sentence. Thank you, Richard, for the info. There's another thing here. Here's our Prince Arch. Prince Charming. She was the closest. We were like, she was like my sister. I feel so bad. That's what he's saying. He was like my sister. Has it not crossed your mind that he probably dated her so he could get access to her? Police say um, who knows the girl's family assaulted the victim three times last summer. Prosecutors say the victim's family agreed to the plea deal and they don't show up because, you know, th th we can't, we don't, there's could be many reasons why they didn't show up. These monsters, they know how to pick, they know how to find their targets. Let's go check out this parole. Okay, it was Paul, Chance, and Paige. And so here's Paige, full-time member. Ms. Paige was appointed to the Connecticut Board of Partners and Paroles as a full-time board member in 2014. So she has been there for 10 years. Think about that. 10 years. She was previously employed as a paralegal at the Burstein, Burstein, and Burstein for 15. You can't even make it up. Burstein, Burstein, and Burstein. For 15 years, assisting the firm's partners and in interviewing clients. She graduated magna cum laude from Albertus Magnus College in 2009. She only first graduated in 2009. So if she's been there for 15 years, if she's been there for 10 years, she got appointed to be on the board of paroles five years after graduating college. Explain to me how anyone can be handpicked by a governor to protect the state of Connecticut when they have only been a graduate for five years. You don't have proper experience. You don't have life experience. There are hundreds of people who would be more qualified explain it to me you cannot there is no logic in it and it shows she is clueless she is clueless about the nature of people who commit these type of offenses it never even crosses her mind that people can be born this way, that they are not fixable. It has nothing to do about being stressed or expressing yourself. You cannot fix this. And let me start with, I, I have worked with attorneys and the paralegals are the ones that I work with the most and they are smart, sharp as whip, they, they, they know the law, what it seems to me, from what I can see, as good as the attorney. They're the ones that are doing all the work. I have a lot of respect for that profession. But her experience coming out of college is to be a paralegal that interviewed clients. And that's interviewed clients. You know who their clients were? People who got hurt. This was a, this law firm 
it is a, a what are they called? The people that that follow accidents. It, it's an injury law firm. It's like one of those meme law firms. Like, are you hurt? Call Burstein, Burstein, and Burstein, and we'll get you the settlement you deserve. I mean, that's her experience. That's insane. Let's just point it out that there's no reason someone would. Now, in Louisiana, we, we had Mr. Kelsey, who all his th experience was being a physical therapist. And I raged the same way. So just shut your mouth if you're going to start accusing me of anything, okay? I see it how it is, and I call it. No one with this experience should be on the last line of defense in protecting your children. Let's see who the next one is. chance she was uh, appointed by the connecticut board of pardons and paroles full-time board member in october 2014 Ms. chance came to the board with more than 16 years supervising experience evaluating parolees this makes sense this is a qualifying position for appropriate placement and parole supervision programs she most recently worked as a therapist with the connections inc where she counseled and assisted parolees in maintaining parole compliance Prior to this position, Ms. Chance served as Director of Employment, Education, and Training for both staff and parolees. Open Heart, da, da, da. Ms. Chance began her work in social services uh, program supervisor and Open Heart Association, responsible for the direct supervision of approximately 50 residents in the parole probation pre-trial stat status, as well as Department of Corrections inmates who receive a variety of services work release opportunities. Okay. I mean, I can see someone like this being a parole board member. It's... Um, it's it's an irrelevant field with 16 years of supervisory experience evaluating parolees. That that makes sense. Not I was a paralegal taking phone calls, listening to someone say, "Wow, I broke my leg." Do you think this is a good client? All right, now we have. So we did. So we have Paul. I do not like Michael Paul man. his questions. Mr. Pohl was appointed to the Connecticut Board of Pardons and Paroles full-time member in May 2019. Prior to his appointment to the board, as a certified teacher, he taught eighth grade. Oh, great. He taught history. He taught history in middle school. Wow, that's real qualified. Uh, from 2009 to 2019, Mr. Pohl earned his degree in Manchester Community College. He earned his degree in Manchester Community College, Charter Oak College, and also performed graduate work at Eastern Connecticut State University. He was appointed in 1986 to the Connecticut Alcohol and Drug Abuse Commission. So this is experience right here, although we don't see him seem to really, he's, he's, he's by no means a Mr. Mirabella, not even close, um, due to his experience and knowledge in the prevention and treatment of alcohol addiction. While CADC commissioner, Mr. Paul interacted with many community-based treatment programs, as well as many Connecticut Department of Correction Addiction Services programs. Mr. Paul is the executive director of Pathfinder Association Manchester, where he began his own personal recovery. Um, for the past 35 years, Mr. Paul has worked with many people in recovery in recent years. You know, it's interesting because justice for peace, I mean, I, I would argue he seems, you know, somewhat qualified. The whole idea that he was a, a high school teacher makes no sense to me. This idea maybe can give some insight, but I don't see this reflection in him. I don't see him catch addicts like the way Mr. Mirabella does or at all. I just don't see it. I don't see um, him putting any of that experience to use. But, you know, I think seeing this information maybe can help understand why these parole hearings are so pathetic. You know, you just can't, you just can't put anyone in a position and expect uh, miraculous results that's just insanity you get what you get the governor handpicked it how why you know there's got to be so many super qualified people that can be in this position that have you know lifetimes of experience like miss jackson like you know like a mr mirabella even you know even ones that were not so uh, mr pete freeman he ran he ran uh, the, the the parole officers, he ran the whole network for like 20 years as the big boss. Mr. O'Shea is a, is a study of law. That's all he did for his life was just study the law. Um, anyways, I'm done my venting. We're about to see something that's even more disturbing. 
And uh, it's scary to think what would happen if someone like that had gotten, would get in front, who are about to watch in front of this parole board, because they would probably just say it's a communication thing. With that, let's go. We have seen every type of monstrous act. The worst of the worst. We have seen them get paroled somehow. We have seen them get little slap on the wrist sentences for doing the worst to their little children before they can even crawl. We have seen every type of betrayal of common sense and justice. But what I'm about to share with you is something that is even more What happens when a man using a surrogate plans to have a child, gives the child a name, and we find out that his plans for having this child born through his surrogate is set for one purpose. And that purpose is for him to abuse. What if I were to tell you that this man is allegedly being accused of this, a man who is prominent in the community, renowned for being a professional and a, a professional in his field. What we're about to review is just that man, that cockroach, that monster. It's important for us to see this because it's important for us to understand that evil does exist. Something that many parole boards don't seem to have quite figured out yet. But let's see how the system <laughs> treats a monster of this magnitude. We'll watch it as it unfolds. But for now, let's jump in. An Elborn man is due in federal court tomorrow. He is charged with distribution of child pornography. The complaint alleges he made some disturbing comments online about wanting to abuse his baby once the baby was born. FBI agents report finding items from the Elborn home of Adam King when they executed a search warrant earlier this month, according to a complaint filed last Thursday. No one was at the Elborn home today. The federal criminal complaint alleges King distributed child pornography of boys and adult men to someone in New York electronically. As a result of that investigation, federal agents secretly engaged King in electronic messages in which King allegedly made comments about planning to sexually assault his baby that was soon to be born by a surrogate. The complaint says he also messaged this photo of an outfit for the baby as well as ultrasound images of the unborn child. It's also alleged that King bragged about sedating children with a double adult dose of Benadryl before assaulting them. According to the complaint, King is employed as a staff ophthalmologist at MedVet Chicago and the ophthalmology department lead for MedVet nationally. He's also described as a Havanese dog breeder and a dog show judge for the American Kennel Club. A manager for MedVet Chicago would not confirm any connection to King. However, he is listed on their website as one of their doctors. We did reach out to MedVet's corporate office, but have not heard back. More details may be revealed when King is in court tomorrow. In Albert, Leah Hope, ABC7 Eyewitness News. All right, Leah, thank you for that. Let's turn to other news. Just within the past hour here, actually, a spokesperson for the American Kennel Club sent us a statement saying... They are aware of the situation, adding, quote, his judging privileges with both the American Kennel Club and the Westminster Kennel Dog Show are revoked. We continue to follow the situation. Now let's jump into that court hearing, see what his defense is, and then we'll unpack it at the end with the documents that Richard provided. The Elber man accused of distributing child pornography will remain in custody. That was the decision today. Today, a federal judge heard arguments and witness testimony about Adam King's detention. The judge decided King will remain in custody, calling the weight of the evidence strong and that he is a serious danger to minors. Today, federal prosecutors argued Adam King should remain in custody, calling the allegations, this is 
heinous, heinous conduct, arguing King is a danger to children, including his baby, who is due to be born later this week via surrogate. The prosecutor telling the judge, I cannot imagine a more vulnerable victim than an infant. King's attorney argued he is not a flight risk and that King's parents could be custodial adults if King would be released on home confinement. King's father testified in the detention hearing today, as did King's husband, who testified he moved in with his parents and would stay there with the couple's soon-to-be-born child. In the complaint, King, described as a veterinary ophthalmologist and dog show judge, was arrested Friday for allegedly distributing child pornography. Photos of King are included in the complaint. It is further alleged King made comments about past child abuse and plans to abuse his unborn baby, sharing photos of baby clothes and an ultrasound. King's husband and father testified they knew nothing about the alleged misconduct of King and his alleged collection of child pornography. The family, as well as King's attorney, declined to comment. King is due back in court April 1st. Okay, so to unpack this again, right? He's, he's I believe he's married to, to another man and they wanted to have a baby. So they have a surrogate who's about to give birth to a baby and he's caught in these chats by the FBI. We're going to go over this. And I love seeing the FBI pull a win because sometimes it just makes us wonder why we don't hear and see more of these type of busts, right? We know how frequent it is just from the YouTube channels with our amateurs running around catching up someone every five minutes, it seems, but the FBI, anyways, this is, this is a big, this one of course is a big catch. And we're going to go see how they did it and how they potentially saved a newborn, a newborn being bred for the purpose of his sadistic, disgusting. It's just, it's, it's beyond fathomable and and i we're gonna want to go through this because of course it's a huge allegation to state that someone really plant you know and then there's one thing where they're going to say well to say it is one thing he of course is demented but did he mean it is there intent there and then he also he had claimed about doing different things to his i believe it's his nephews and nieces where he gave specific dates and he gave specific manners of how he abused them. So those are all things that <laughs> um, you do wonder. You do wonder what his defense is going to be. So let's go. An Elburn veterinarian and nationally known dog show judge has been arrested on the FBI charges of distributing child CP. Um, he's 39 years old, was arrested March 22nd after an investigation reportedly found that he had sent sexually explicit images and videos of children being sexually abused to a man in New York. Criminal complaint filed in a federal court also alleges that King uh, told the, that same person that he planned to sexually abuse his newborn son when he had returned home from with him from California, where the surrogate mother lived. King's arrest stems from a criminal investigation initiated last year when the FBI accessed the Telegram and Scruff accounts of a suspected New York pedo. The man had been chatting with numerous other people, including a Chicago area man identified as Per Chai Dude. That's his Telegram name, huh? Wow. Great job. They're all a the freaking same. Purv Chai Dude was connected to King's computer after investigators determined that his scruff account, I, I haven't heard of scruff, so I guess that's just another one of these pedo things, um, accessed the internet while at hotels in Pennsylvania and Illinois on dates records showing King had stayed and registered guests in both hotels. When the FBI executed search warrants at King's home on March 5th, he declined to be interviewed but did give agents the password to his smartphone. He had deleted his Telegram account, but the scruff account was still on the phone. King sought to be released on bond, citing his family ties, steady employment, established connection, and a history of pedo. Oh, no, he forgot to he forgot that part, right? And a lack of criminal record. His lawyers also submitted five letters from friends and family members uh, touting his character and trustworthiness. These, these, it's a good question to ask. You know, would you write a letter if there are allegations about a loved one, would you just say, you know what, I'm just trusting this loved one? I mean, I, it's not fair. I think people would be in shock if this were to happen to their loved ones and they just wouldn't be able to process it. 
the government responded that all that was because it, it's just such a breach of everything you know right it's like no no no, that person it can't be it just can't be and why would you believe some third party fbi thing if if you know it it, it it doesn't just make it that that person's a liar. It just destroys your foundation of everything you thought was true. You you lose faith in yourself and your ability to judge character and, and what's real and what's fake. And it's, so it's it's a lot. The government response responded that all that was not evidence that does not pose further danger to the community. Indeed, it was record shows that he had all of those while engaging in criminal conduct charge. Calling evidence against King extremely compelling and the nature and circumstances of the offense's charge heinous. Prosecutors um, went into detail regarding the nature of the circumstances of King's alleged behavior. While King has been charged with a single with charged with a single count of possession of material constituting containing CP and not sexual abuse of a minor, prosecutors focus heavily on online statements that say King made indicating that he has a history of such abuse. After New York suspect was arrested, federal agents reportedly discovered child CP images and videos and electronic devices he owned in Texas, Texas to and from numerous individuals via the apps, T Telegram, and Scruff, including King, a.k.a. Perv Child. Perv Chai Dude. What a name, huh? In September 2023, text the New York man reportedly asked King about his preferred age range in children, and King replied, single digits, i.e. under 10, are my favorite. During the same scruff chat, prosecutors say King sent other men two sexually explicit videos, including one depicting an adult white male penetrate. Um, a prepubescent boy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people do, like, I, it's nothing new because of all the, the child predator stuff I watch on YouTube. Actually, I don't watch a lot, but there's one channel which, that I that I've become impressed with. Um, what's his name? It's with uh, his last name is Rosen. I think he, they're he's, they're talented, and they and, and they don't they're not obnoxious. There's nothing obnoxious about it. It's like they just do their job. Law enforcement authorities began communicating with the uh, proof Chi dude in November 2023 using the online covert employee OCE post um, as a New York man. Prosecutors say King texted back to OCE that uh, zero to nine years old, my favorite boy and girl, though prefer boy, and sent OCE images and videos depicting CP. According to the criminal complaint, King also told OCE that he had sexually assaulted a four-year-old boy and had previously drugged and sexually assaulted, abused his nephew, his nieces, and nephews. You know, and his father is still going there and saying, no, no, no have him stay by me. And, I mean, a father's going to have to be in denial. They're going to have to say, no, no, there's just no chance. But... I, I I can't blame the father for 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 being in denial. Frankly, I play with I play with nephews and nieces. Prosecutors say, "Prove she dude wrote on November 9th, I've done almost everything. Not sexual intercourse. Can't send them home damaged, but I've molested them." It's just it's so what he's writing to this plant. It's so. Um, it's so specific, it's so detailed that it, it, it's it, it's impossible to think that it's not true. He told OCE he used double adult dose of Benadryl to sedate the children before molesting them, his nephews, his nieces. King also informed the OCE that he and his husband, who referred to as non-perv, were expecting a son by surrogate mother in late March, and that he was planning to sexually molest the infant ASAP. I do love the idea of inviting a buddy over when I have my boy. He texts OCE. Just has to be someone I can trust, obviously. I, 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 in the same text conversation, he sent a photograph of the baby's outfit and he gifted and commented. And he said, we got so much baby stuff for Christmas. FBI agents photographed that the same piece of clothing in King's closet. I they, they, uh, they, this monster needs to get life. So we're going to follow this case as it progresses. 
I can't imagine he's going to take any type of plea deal. I just can't. Here's uh, more information by the FBI. Probable cause. And again, thank you, Richard, for obtaining this. Um, so it gives more detailed information if you're interested on, on how the FBI did this. So summary set forth in detail below in and around October of 2023 while investigating the online sexual exploitation of minors, the FBI identified a subject in New York. The FBI subsequently obtained executive search warrants to search New York subjects' electronic devices. Within those devices, the FBI identified communications between New York subjects and subjects who claimed to be located in and around Chicago. The FBI observed that Chicago subject had communicated to New York subject using a social media communication called Scruff under ID blah, blah, blah. Um, the FBI further determined that Chicago subjects also communicated in New York with encrypted internet messaging service Telegram using the account handle per she dude or whatever. In those Telegram communications, the FBI discovered in September 2023, um, including specifically one hour about September 11, 2023, a subject using the perv she dude account has sent several images, uh, video depicting CP to the New York subject. After searching New York electronics devices, the FBI obtained New York permission to his her Telegram account, account handled SBLNYC. In late 2023 and 2024, FBI used SB01NYC account to engage in several text conversations with Chicago subject over TG. In those text conversations, the Chicago subject sent images. So I guess this is like an informant, right? Who they turned. That's why they, they said he, she. I think that's what I'm, I'm understanding. Um, that he had large digital cache of child CP stored on TG and stated that he had previously drugged and sexually abused his nieces and nephews. The Chicago subject further stated that he and his husband are expecting a child due in spring. He plans to assault the child when it's born. In the same text conversation, uh, the Chicago subject sent a photograph of a baby's outfit. The Chicago subject also provided uh, personally identifying information over TG. One, that his name's Adam. Two, that he lives in Chicago. Can you imagine he, he gives his real name? And three, um, that he works in medicine, specializing in eyes. And four, he sent photographs that he claimed to, claimed to be his penis, which appears to be that of a white male. The FBI obtained internet protocol uh, records for the Chicago subject Scruff account. Those records show that in 2019, Chicago Scruff accessed the internet in certain hotels. So this is where they matched up. They knew it was him. Um, I like seeing how the FBI did this. This is great stuff. I want to count on this run during this execution of the Warren FBI agents discovered King in a shower with his. Oh, listen to this. Um, The baby was due, by the way, March 29th. So the baby, think about this, unless the baby's late by a week, which is possible, the baby will have been born. And thank God is safe. Um, on or about March 5th, 2024, the FBI executed. So this is a job. Imagine being an FBI agent here and knowing that you saved an innocent baby. Like, this is something that, man, you feel good about. Imagine then on the flip side of the profession is being the defense attorney for this roach. You should trust him. He's a great outstanding man. And I get it. They're public defenders. They're doing, they're making the world go round. They got to do their thing. But man, I would, it's just like pick a side, you know, I would recuse myself. I'm sure public attorneys have the option to recuse themselves, right? Like just say, no, I just can't do this. On or about March 5th, 2024, the FBI executed a search warrant on King's residence. During the execution of the warrant, the FBI agents discovered King in the shower with his cellular phone, despite multiple announcements of the presence of the FBI agents conducting the search. So he, I don't think it was a coincidence that he was in the shower with his phone. I think he actually said, oh my God, I need to run into the shower with the phone. Maybe he'll buy me some time. Law enforcement found a baby outfit in the residence consisting with the image sent by the Chicago subject over TG telegram to the New York subject in support of Perchie Dew's claim of the being father to be. During a forensic search of King's iPhone, the FBI observed that the telegram application had previously been installed on the iPhone but had been deleted. 
Artifacts um, from the forensic image of King's iPhone indicated that the Telegram app was used on his iPhone as recent as March 3rd, 2024. Yep, I also discovered on King's iPhone several images that the Chicago subject sent to the New York subject via per Chiju Telegram account, including the photograph of a white male's penis and ultrasound photograph. He sent right a picture of the ultrasound. Also found on King's iPhone were text messages indicating King was in North District, Illinois on um, about September 11th, 2023. The same did the Chicago subject, several images and video depicting child, child CP to the New York subject. Based on these facts and those listed below, I submit the probable cause exists to believe that on or about September 11, 2023, Adam King distributed CP in violation of Title 18, State Code, blah, blah, blah. <sighs> so they got him in just like one count, I guess. That was it. And now they're going to have to to grow it out from there. And man, they're going to, you know, they're going to find everything. But I do wonder if you can use any of these words, I guess this is what you take to a court, right? If they can prove like, you know, what he said is true, what he did to his nephews and nieces, what his intentions are, if those are true versus just what they'll say, it's just an innocent fantasy. Um, I think the rest is just, oh, they go into detail. You don't want to read this. Wow. Um, that, look at that. How freaking scary is that? You gotta be kidding me. This is what the photograph he sends. He sends a photograph of a baby outfit for his unborn baby. And he's viewing this as sexual. This, um, I can only imagine he's going to go to court. Here he is, huh? Look at him. He's a judge. He's such a great guy. You just never know. Psychos everywhere. Scary. Scary, scary, scary. I mean, how can you turn a baby outfit hanging in the closet into something that gives you chills and makes you have nightmares? That's what he just did. So we'll cover this case as it continues. I uh, only expect that he will be sent away for life. And they better make that happen. With that, I'll let you go.